Hey, what's going on guys? Another interesting list of links. Um, this isn't specifically tech tutorials or anything like that, but it's interesting and semi-tech related stuff that I think is worth taking a look at or reading. Uh, the first one is on this Andrew Alexander Price blog, talking about cities, places, uh, places and non-places. So, you know, like this is sort of a concrete filled area, not a lot of interesting Things, and then a European city, uh, Stockholm, where you can see lots of natural spaces, and it's a city that feels very pleasant to be in. It reminded me a little bit of the design patterns. You know the design patterns people for, for development originally read that design patterns, I guess in like city regional design book, it was like some other guy's book that they based all their work on, or that they were inspired by. And reading that original work, it's a huge book, and I haven't read it all, but they talk a lot about, or, or the author talks a lot about, um, you know, what makes places feel good and, like, what makes designs feel good. It, small things, like, you know, if a room is lit from two sides, so if it has windows on two two sides, it will feel, like, infinitely more pleasant to be in. And if you just watch people naturally, you'll find that they tend to congregate in places that are lit from two sides because it just feels much better for the human organism. And this blog post is sort of in the same vein, a discussion of what makes places feel livable and feel pleasant and what makes other places feel unpleasant. Uh, he talks about places being primarily designed for cars or for people and that we just have like a visceral reaction to one of those things feeling much more nice. You know, it's a pretty interesting read if you're into like weird abstract stuff that maybe helps you think about design. The next one is a New York Times article from 1984, which I thought was great. This is posted on the um, uh, Dragonfly BSD lazy reading list, I think. But it's just an opinion piece on why window managers and windowed interaction with an operating system is not ideal. You know, so many papers spread out in overlapping piles on a desk with just their edges sticking out, criticizing what a windowed environment with a whole lot of applications running simultaneously starts to feel and look like. Uh, I myself have switched to a tiling window manager, um, i3. There's a bunch out there. Uh, I recommend you try at least one windowed tiling manager. It's hard to go back once you've adjusted to it. It takes a couple of days, but then you realize, wow, I'm doing everything at sort of twice the speed that I'm used to in terms of manipulating, like context switching between applications, knowing where things are, immediately being able to get to something. It just makes you much, much faster. So I, re I recommend tiled window managers. It it's funny because it's from 1984 and I think it's great that it's even still around because as you'll see in one of the later websites, it's not always the case for old content that has value. It just uh, disappears very quickly from the net. Um, another, again, completely <laughs> 1995, why the web won't be your nirvana. Yeah, talking about how the internet and, and the web itself uh, are not going to be a replacement for things like libraries and commerce and blah, blah, blah. Uh, pretty interesting. Obviously, another prediction that wasn't entirely correct. And here's what I was alluding to before. All my blogs are dead about how much of the content that he's been writing professionally it has disappeared because uh, places go out of business. So this guy basically talks about the experience of having moved uh, or having sent out, you know, resumes that reference content that he's written on websites, expecting that content to still be there. And, you know, it turns out that most of it's completely gone, you know, just sitting in a database archive somewhere, if that, you know, occasionally probably completely destroyed you know, what happens to all this content we're creating when it's all centered around businesses controlling access to that content and deciding what to do with it is that as soon as, you know, a company gets bought or goes out of business, that things disappear and it's very hard to get them back. It's also one of the reasons why I like the Wayback Machine and the archive, web archive project are uh, important and awesome. What blogging has become? Allegedly, the post is about Medium. But I just uh, thought that the part that was actually interesting about this is kind of the quick view that they take at the beginning about how web writing has become dependent on a couple huge traffic providers. 
and that really like Facebook and Twitter driving traffic to places uh, is so huge that when those services temporarily go down, that most even like journalistic, not just clickbait sites lose like 60% of their traffic as soon as Facebook goes down. It's kind of horrifying that these social networks, which, you know, to people maybe like us that are not so active on social networks and who are like, okay, that's just this weird thing that technology noobs use that we don't realize that that's like a browser to you and me for most people, that that is how they access the web by clicking on links on Facebook and not by actually using hyperlinks and reading up on things and, you know, taking a topic and looking at several information sources about that topic and then digging deeper that way. That it really is just like, what are my friends posting on Facebook? Give it a quick view, move on to the next thing in my feed. Kind of crazy. Always useful. What laptop do you use? I finally invested in something that costs more than four or 500 bucks. And I got myself a decent System76 laptop, but I've had some problems with it. And so I'm always kind of on the lookout for what people are using. Specifically, you know, I'm, I'm interested in hardware that I can also use with um, BSD operating systems, and that obviously constrains me a little bit. The ThinkPads seem to do pretty well across the board. So a lot of people, um, they're obviously very pricey, but um, I think a couple jobs ago, I actually had a ThinkPad at work, and it was, it really was a very nice laptop. And I'm thinking for my next one to go back there. System 76 for me, it's a great, it's a great machine, and it's great if you don't need anything except for Ubuntu with their drivers and their little repo. But even moving to Debian was kind of a pain in the ass, and the BSDs don't work at all because it's you know i7, Haswell, blah blah blah. Anyway, this stuff can become pretty hair extractingly annoying after a while. So checking threads like this every once in a while to see, you know, what laptops people are using and are happy with using open source operating systems. It's a good thing to do every once in a while. Fearing China. A very interesting article by a guy who runs a mail server for a company. And due to some DNS poisoning in China, uh, a whole ton of traffic was directed his way instead of to where it was supposed to go, to the actual servers that it was supposed to go to. And it's just ridiculous to look at the network graph. I mean, you see like 52 megabits per second at the peak. It's just ridiculous. You know, it's something that uh, would be incredibly hard to deal with. So he talks about, you know, everything basically on the machine being unresponsive and then him blocking port 80 and 443 and that at least getting things to a place where he could start working on what to do. The result, I mean, his solution ended up being fixing the Apache default vhost so that it wasn't processing the request anymore, that they were just being blocked. But I just love this graph. Man, just uh, ridiculous. Anyway, something interesting for learning from somebody else's absolute worst case experience. Dogecoin. Dogecoin? I still don't know how to pronounce that stuff. One of the smart people that is interesting to read from, uh, Steve Klabnik. Some stuff about Bitcoin. I mean, he's a very vocal anti-Bitcoin person just discussing how this cryptocurrency is sort of, uh, I mean, it's sort of a very basic, what is value and what is currency supposed to be and what is money? But um, beyond that, it's just interesting to, to the point that he makes about Dogecoin basically replicating a lot of the financial infrastructure of the regular financial system and that when you say well this is a mockery of currency then you're really admitting that about uh, all of our normal currencies as well so um, pretty interesting little article z shell tricks everybody knows i love z shell uh, i've actually started doing a tutorial on z shell and just the basics i really recommend that you try z shell just a quick plug if you do just use i dare you to use z shell by installing Z Shell and then installing the Oh My Z Shell project from GitHub, I think it's O dash so O H dash My dash Z S H dot I O or something like that. Just clone that project, use the presets it comes with, and you will never want to go back to Bash. It's just a phenomenal uh, way to work if you spend a lot of time on the command line. Um, so. There's just some interesting stuff you can use environment variables and functions. This is worth it just for the for the up three. So <laughs> there's a function in here that basically lets you write uh, in, in the shell 
up and then a number and it will just automatically go up for that. So it's very simple. None of these are very complicated, but just super useful things um, that you may want to look at if you use Z shell. Okay. I know this. We've all seen Jurassic Park and we've all seen that scene where the granddaughter of the founder of Jurassic Park is working and going, I know this. It's a Unix system. And I know it's like often ridiculed, but we all know it's actually that was basically a real interface. Someone made a game. <laughs> it's great. It's just a free game. You can just go download this. Uh, I have downloaded it. It's kind of addictive. It's very simple, but fun to play. And it just replicates that interface that we've all seen in Jurassic Park. You can kind of move through this, this file system. It's a simple game, but it's very fun. The I Know This Game. Here you go. Here's a video of someone playing it. You remember this from Jurassic Park, right? It's awesome. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to play this? Okay, A Whole New World. A guy talking about a text editor that he's been writing. It's got some very interesting ideas, and I recommend you just take a look at this. Specifically, the concept of layering that he put into this text editor. If you have any interest in, in text editors or you know what's out there and what might be interesting to think about, specifically um, the layers, like having a, a type layer and a crash layer that you can kind of, among other things, that you can overlay on your code so that you can be writing some code, executing it, and then having a layer that basically says that takes the output of whatever stack trace that running the code actually then runs and then overlaying the stack trace on top of your source code just a great idea i mean really cool stuff so you can literally have a stack trace in the actual source code pointing to the problem itself there's a lot of other ideas in here that's just a quick sample idea really cool the networks of new york this guy basically went through and interpreted and traced and mapped the physical infrastructure of the net uh, in New York City. I recommend that you support a project like this because it's just awesome. But it basically tells you what all those mysterious markings mean. And there's a very interesting, uh, if you go back to the site itself, seeingnetworks.in, uh, there's some really interesting stuff that helps you interpret like what what the infrastructure is because it's stuff that you see on telephone poles it's marking that you see on the ground and um yeah like manhole cover designs and the really <laughs> i don't know if this is intentional but a really humorous understated way of basically telling you at the end of every paragraph oh by the way this company was also bought by one of these conglomerates, which is owned by one of the other conglomerates. And it basically always seems to end on, there's like two companies that own everything else. Every bit of the US internet infrastructure through a vast network of, of like these shell companies with shared ownership and everything owning a bit of each other. And that you really come back to a couple huge companies that control everything. But that's not a problem, right? Why would that ever be a problem? Okay, Modern C. This is really cool. It's an open source C book. So if you're learning C and you want to develop in C, obviously we are all told, oh, go read K and R because Kernigan and Ritchie designed the language and it's fantastic. But really that's not a modern dialect of the language anymore. So you have something like this. It's definitely still in progress. It's not complete. But the book basically has uh, three levels. Oh, maybe it's four levels. Hang on. Um, where you basically go from sort of an apprentice to a master. They call it acquaintance, which is like very basic syntax stuff. Cognition being like, how do you actually use this stuff? Experience, uh, you know, design patterns, performance, you know, higher level considerations when writing software. And then a section on, you know, where he would like the language to go, how to add things to language or what to add, where it should go in the future. Very interesting stuff. I've only played with C. I started going through Kernigan and Ritchie and doing the exercises, but I've never really, I never really dove in and wrote real, you know, large software uh, with C. So this might be a really good resource for anyone who's wondering. I mean, you know, this is the language that the operating systems we use today are written in. So... If you want to talk to the low-level APIs of those operating systems, you know, this is the language you're using. So it might have quite a bit of payoff to learn how to use a modern dialect, um, you know, the sort of current best practice for writing software in C. Has modern Linux lost its way? 
this is an article I could really uh, relate to because I've been using Jesse. Uh, I've been using Debian for a while. Like Debian, I know they do some weird stuff with you know config files and and extra weird packaging things where they do a lot of stuff that's different from the upstream. But I've forgiven it because it's been a very stable operating system for a very long time, a very stable distribution. But Jesse's just been a nightmare, and uh, I know that the warning is don't use an unstable version. But I want new software, and I want new packages, and I don't want a lot of fussing about. And that's always worked out so far with Debian. This is really just an article about some annoyances. It's not... But, you know, maybe they're annoyances that are indicative of some kind of deeper issue. I will let you decide. All right, so that's it for this edition of the sysadmin vaguely IT related sysadmin -y. sure you can do this at work links I hope you enjoyed leave a comment subscribe if you're not already and I've got some interesting stuff coming up in terms of tutorials and another project I've been working on I will tell you about that pretty soon see you in the next video